Good afternoon. This is Bob with County Records Research and thank you for joining us for our Friday webinar. Today is March 31st. It's the last day of March in 2017. This is a fast moving year. We're having a lot of opportunities to find properties this year and I've just uh, activated the visual portion of my screen so we're going to go ahead and get started right away. As you know, Friday presentations are designed to get right in and look at properties that are uh, going to auction so that we can get an idea of what opportunities await us. And our focus as researchers is to find opportunities where they lie. So what we're doing is we're like the hunter that's going out into the uh, into the wild and finding those properties where they might be and then making a decision on how to get those properties based on the information that's provided. Remember every opportunity has its own characteristics, every deal has its own makings. So what we want to do is have as good a plan as possible for ourselves so that we can react accordingly. You know some people will go out into the wild and they will set up a trap for an animal. Some people will go out there with an arrow and a bow, and some people will use a firearm to go get their prey in the hunting uh, vernacular. When we're out there going after foreclosure properties, we have five different ways to buy a property that Kurt has taught us how to use. Uh, and mainly what we're trying to do first and foremost is find those opportunities and determine which method is the most appropriate to bag the game, so to speak. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select the option to log in on my account. And I'm going to go ahead and type in my username and my password. And I'm going to go ahead and put in my... Um, this little capture word. Now, notice the numbers and letters here. I am not capitalizing because I don't have to. We just use lowercase to get into the site and then just hit submit and now I'm into my account. So I've just logged into my account. Now, if you haven't joined us yet for one of our Wednesday presentations, on Wednesday we teach you the different features and benefits of the account. Um, on how to use uh, the saved property search option and how to use the My Properties window. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and do some searching. Now we've got some events coming up next month where Kurt's going to be out in San Diego County and he's going to be in, um, in uh, actually out in Las Vegas. So we've got some very interesting events, live events coming up next month. So let me just point out the fact that we have our calendar of events. Notice on our format on the website we have a lot of buttons here on the bottom. Each of these phrases is a button. So if I click on my calendar of upcoming events, this is how you find um, how to join us for our live webinars down below right here. Above that is our field trip events. These are the live uh, auction location events that are held during the daytime because that's when the auctions are held. So notice Kurt's going to be on April 7th, which is about a week from now. He's going to be on Main Street in El Cajon, which is San Diego County. And we're going to look at some San Diego properties to kind of give you a heads up on how we're going to do our research. So that's uh, going to be happening next Friday down in San Diego County. Now, Below that is our April 27th event out in Las Vegas. This is on 4th Street in Las Vegas. That's um, um, Clark County in Nevada. And so Kurt's going to be out there doing a live event for a company called um, Paper Source. It's a note symposium. And here are some links at the bottom of our event page if you want to learn more about that. Now that's towards the end of the month, but the rooms are selling out. That is not our event. However, Kurt is the keynote speaker for the Thursday uh, presentation, and he's also going to be doing a Thursday morning field trip. Now, next week, we're going to be doing an event on April 6th. This is the one in San Diego, and that's the San Diego Investment Club. And here's a link you can click on to visit their site. They use meetup.com, so you can go through that site to uh, register to attend that meeting. And that's going to be from 6 to 7 on April 6th which is Thursday. So Thursday night, Kurt will be doing this presentation, and then Friday morning, he'll be doing the field trip. 
Okay, so this is the events page. So that being said, let's move on and have some fun shopping properties in San Diego County. So first of all, I'm going to select my property search option. And this, and this opens up my window um, where I have the option to pick a county. So you notice that I have my, um, uh, I have uh, all five states at the top, California, Nevada, Arizona, Washington and Oregon. So I can pick any of the zones in any of the states because I have all the zones. Now if you have an account with all the zones you can do so as well. Now if I go back to the California tab, notice that I can now pick San Diego County. Now these are alphabetical, so if I move to the right, San Diego County is about halfway down in my third column. And notice if I put my cursor over the county name, that I get a little dialog window that opens up that tells me the different cities in the county. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and check the box to the right of San Diego County. And notice, intuitively, we kind of want to check the box to the left. If I check the box to the left of San Diego County, I'd be looking in Marin County. Not that that's a bad idea. Marin County is a beautiful area, and we have helped people buy up in that area. However, San Diego County is where Kurt's going to be next week, and so that's where I'm going to go shopping. So now I've picked San Diego County, and I'm going to scroll further down. Now, notice the single property search. We're going to use this in just a few minutes to demonstrate how we do secondary research once we've established an interest in a specific property. Okay? But first, I'm going to go down to my general property search, and I'm going to put together a targeted search based on the fact that I know Kurt's going to be out in San Diego County next Friday. So first of all, I've got a couple of choices to make. Uh, notice a default is the first category that's always going to be selected when we come to this page. And a notice a default record is the first group of properties that have entered foreclosure. A notice of default states that the lender has established that the property is behind on payments. Now, we have a listed date range down below that is matched up to the notice of default choice. And this listed date range is always going to be looking backwards, like looking in your rear view mirror when you're driving your car. So you'll notice that there's a date range here that starts with two weeks ago, March 17th, and then it ends in today's date. Every day, this, this search range is going to be modified to include today's date and looking backwards to uh, two weeks ago. Now, am I locked into that range? No, I can expand this further. Now, it's important to recognize the reason we have March 31st here in the right-hand window is that that is the most I can go forward because this is based on when we add the record to our system. So today's date is the most recent date that I can use in terms of putting together a list of notices of default. So if I want to have a broader and deeper range of properties, what I then could do is I can take this first date and go backwards. So watch what I do. I'm going to select the calendar, and then I'm going to go up on top. Notice how it's got March. To the, to the left of the word today here in the center under the March uh, month uh, box is an arrow pointing to the left. Also notice to the left of that arrow is a double arrow. I'm going to use the single arrow and go back one month to February. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to select um, February 28th. Okay, and let's see if it lets me go ahead and do that search. Okay, now notice what I just did. Now for the purposes of the demonstration, I'm using Google Chrome as my browser. So you'll notice the little tabs up on top that represent my open windows. So I now have two windows open on my browser. I have the search results page that gives me a map on top and a list of addresses below. Map on top, addresses below. Now, the map reflects a certain number of records. Always when we set up a search on the site, we're going to get 20 records in our initial search results or less. Now, if the results of my search were less than 20, I would only see as many as are, are available. But because I chose to expand my search range to a total of a month, I actually have a larger number. I have actually 336 total records. So I have 0 to 20 of 
336. So I've got quite a few records, but I'm only seeing the first 20. Now whenever you do a search like this, if it's bigger than 20, under the map and on the left, I can go to where it says show 20, 40, 60. I can click on the 60. And that gives me, now, sometimes you'll see this. This is an artifact. Notice how it looks like this property here is out in Ohio. <laughs> okay. That just means that I've got a piece of property here that for some reason the system is picking this up as being uh, geocoded in a different state. That's out of our control. That's actually being done uh, um, through the Internet. And so we just simply picked up the wrong geocoding for that particular address. And that'll, that can be corrected later. So, but most of your properties, of course, should all fall down in this San Diego County area where I set up my search. And this is what uh, we would normally be seeing is this, this is what my map should have looked like without that artifact sitting out in Ohio. Now, all these are notices of default. They're orange push pins on the map. Notice if I put my cursor over any of the uh, orange push pins that a little address window opens up. Now, if I want to go into these profiles, I can then just put my cursor into the profile and click on the address and open the record. So these are all notices of default. And again, notice what's just happened. I just opened that property profile by clicking on the address. Now I have three windows open. I have the property that I've looked at. I have the search results list, and I have my main page. Okay. Now I can close any of these out, but don't close your main page unless you want to get out of the website. All right. You can close out your search results. You can close out your profiles and get back into the main page, and you'll be fine. Okay. If you close out your main page, you're going to have to start over. So try not to do that. And make sure you catch yourself before you do. Now. This is a profile of a notice of default record on a property in San Diego County. And I just wanted you to see the difference uh, because when you're looking at a, a notice of default record, what you're seeing is you're seeing the very first shoe to drop in a foreclosure. Now the profile layout is the same between a notice of default and a notice of sale. Notice I have a map on the right, loans on the left. Map on the right, loans on the left. Okay, now this particular property, the trustor is the borrower, the owner is the person on title. These will usually be the same person. So Rosendo Salman is the trustor. So Rosendo is the person who borrowed a loan on a property. Now Rosendo is also the person on title. And normally when we see this kind of a layout, we're going to find that the person has a mailing address that matches the house, and we do. So Rosendo is the borrower who borrowed the money. Rosendo is also the owner who owns the property and is their primary residence because this is where they get their mail. Okay. Now, below Rosendo's information, we have a delinquent amount of $21,009. So this is delinquency. This is how far Rosendo has fallen behind on the property. And this is how much I'd have to come up with if I wanted to bring the loan current and buy the house from Rosendo. Now, what else do we know? We know that there's only one loan on the property here below for $420,000. And the loan was taken out on September 12th of 2006. Now, this is important. The loan is from 2006. Now, let's scroll down a little bit and learn more about Rosendo's home. Notice the purchase date on the property is 1993. So 1993 is the purchase date. 2006 is the loan date. This is a refinance loan. So we're learning more about Rosendo. We've never been to the house, right? But we're learning more and more about the property simply by looking at the information provided on the report. So we know Rosendo bought his property in 1993. He paid $139,000. Sometime in 2006, he got an opportunity to borrow $420,000 on the property. Now, first of all, that's only about, what, um, 13 years since he originally bought the house in December of 93. He probably had the loan still from his purchase in 93, and that loan was probably paid off when he refinanced and took out the 420. So our research is showing the 420 as a first, and I think that's probably right. Now, 
We also know that the delinquency is about $21,000 and the loan is about 11 years old because it's 2017 today and the loan's from 2006. So I'm going to hazard a guess and I think Rosenda owes right about what he owed or right about what he borrowed 11 years ago. I'm going to say he probably owes about 420. It's probably even Steven. Now, what else do I know? I know that we have a, an amount here, an estimate of value of about $514,000 on this property. So it looks like he's got about 90000 in equity. And again, I'm making some educated guesses here, but I think if we did the math and had a sit-down conversation with this guy, we're probably going to find out I'm pretty close to correct. Now, what really matters is what am I willing to pay for this house? Because in any situation where we want to invest in a property, whether we're going to live in it, rent it out, or flip it as an investment, then we need to know how much we intend to pay for this property. What makes sense, not for Rosendo, but for me? because I'm the one that's making the purchase. So if I'm going to buy this property from this gentleman, I need to come in with a price. Just as if I was going to buy a car on a used car lot, I better have a price in mind or that, or that uh, sales guy is going to get what he wants out of me. And similarly, if I go to this guy and I say I want to buy your property, well, I can guarantee you he's going to want to pay off his loan, plus he's going to want some walking around money, and so he's going to have a price in his head. So I've got to have a price in my head so I get the right price for me because what matters in any situation when we're buying as an investor is what makes sense for our plan, whether it's a business plan where I have to flip it and make some money or whether I'm buying a house for myself and I just want to make sure I don't overpay. So bottom line is we have to have a number in mind. Now our system gives us an estimate of value of 514000 I have to point this out. This 514 in a, in a uh, perfect world is the amount that I could sell this house for after I've fixed it up and paid my realtor. Okay, so bottom line is this, this estimate of value is again a perfect world scenario what I could sell it for. What if I go to sell this house and I can only get an offer of 500000 because there's something about it that, that is affecting my value? Well, one of the first things I want to do when I check out a property I'm interested in is I want to go up to the map and I want to use my zoom in capabilities because notice the dark blue push pin in the center. Okay, the, the subject property will always be centered in the map. And notice on the left hand side I've got the arrow, I'm sorry, I've got magnifying glasses with pluses and minuses. Now, these are uh, very helpful in terms of zooming in if you're using a tablet or a, uh, a smartphone and you don't have access to a mouse. Uh, that's very controllable if you're just using the touch screen. So these allow you to zoom in and out by just clicking on buttons. Okay, But notice that they zoom in and out pretty, pretty fiercely. There's not a lot of tight control. Now, I'm using a desktop mouse with the little wheel. Now notice how the wheel allows me to gradually zoom in and narrow in on the property. Now I'm going to hit the bird's eye function and see what the house looks like and zoom in again. Okay, it looks like your standard tract home. Okay, nothing, uh, nothing hugely bad, nothing hugely good. Okay, now don't mind that little black thing there. Okay, now looks like they've got a little, little uh, portable pool there. So okay, he's got a little patio. Again, your typical little tract home. Uh, this is a. Now I'm going to go down to the property details. This is a four bedroom, two bath. He's got a 1,320 square foot house. 5,600 square foot lot, and the house was built in 1971. Okay, so it's pretty, we, we pretty know what we got here. So now, one of the things that I'm going to do really quick is I'm going to check the link to Zillow to see if he's already listed his home, and he has not. Now, notice also the reason I go to Zillow is to see if the house is on the market or off, if it's pending escrow. Sometimes it'll say pending because the, the owner of the property has elected to sell the property or has accepted an offer from someone like you or me. You'd be shocked at how many of these properties never make it to auction because someone just like you went to the house and got the listing or made the offer. So don't hesitate to take a step forward and present an offer to folks because if you fail to do so, somebody else will. Now, Zillow says this place is worth about 526,000. Notice the difference. 526 from Zillow, 514 from us. So there's a difference of about $12,000. Not much, 
but enough to make a difference. Now, if I'm going to go place an offer on this property, I need to find out what that number really is. What are properties selling for in this area that match this one? And it's a very basic tract home, four bedroom, two bath, built in 1971, concrete backyard, not so well kept lawn, um, and I don't know the whole area of the neighborhood. Now, if you want to become an expert on an area, we recommend that you do. If you're a realtor or a broker and you want to become an expert on this area near Flanders Drive, then you want to become an expert on this area. I would focus on the area between Camino Ruiz, Mira Mesa, uh, and so you've got this area and this little lake that you got over here. I would get to know this area. I'd also get to know what's in the vicinity. We've got a park. Um, could there be a college nearby? Got a few different parks. Okay. Now, if you're an expert on San Diego County, okay, there's the college. There's San Diego Miramar College. If you know what's in an area, then you know certain things that have certain value. For instance, this might be a great rental property to rent out uh, to students going to the college. So certain things add value, certain things take value away. Realtors know this, and if you don't have an experienced realtor that's a friend, then you can learn a little bit more about it by doing some studying. And the bottom line is you need to put a value on this property. Now, as I said, Zillow says it's worth about 526. Our system says 514. You need to narrow that down. This is going to tell you how much you could flip the property for, potentially at the conclusion of a purchase. So now if I go to this gentleman and offer to buy his house, then I would backtrack and say, what is it going to cost me to fix it up? He bought the house in 93. He refinanced it in 06, but looking from the pictures, it doesn't look like he fixed the place up all that much. It looks like he took equity out and was probably using it to do other things. He might have done a little bit of upgrading on the property, but I'm still going to have a lot of originals from a house built in 1971. So let me say as an, as an investor, I might set a, a target price point of about 400000 on this property, just as a general rule. Assuming I'm going to have to spend about 20 or 30 grand to fix it up, I'm going to have to pay a realtor to show it. I am going to have to pay Uncle Sam some taxes on my profit on the sale, and therefore I might want to make sure that I'm going to walk away with at least 30 grand at the end of everything. Okay, so maybe I'm going to walk away with 30 grand at the end of everything. So I'm going to say, let's set a price. And again, this is important to set a price. So now, if my price is 400,000, and I think that Rosendo owes 420 then my offer is a short sale, okay? Now let's say I go to make my offer of 400,000 and he says, no, I've got to pay off the 420, this is really important to me, and I look at my numbers and I say, okay, can I make this work? Then I would decide maybe, maybe go ahead and offer the 420, but then once I get into an escrow, then I have the potential to draw that back a little bit and maybe drop it to 410 if I discover a lot of problems within the property. Now again, this is the decision you make as an investor, because once you start stepping into the area where you're offering less than what is owed, then you're involving a third party, you're involving the lender, and they have the power to disengage the escrow by saying, no, we want our 420 minimum, or we won't let you close this sale. So just remember, once you go below what's owed on the property, you're involving a third party. As an investor, you just have to keep that in mind. Now let's say, for instance, you checked everything out and you decide, I cannot spend more than 400. And you go to Rosendo, he says okay, but the lender says no. Or you go to Rosendo and he says no. If the deal doesn't come together now, it could come together later because other investors will have the same mindset. And if this property got a notice of default here on February 27th, notice the as of date, then that means if nobody can put a deal together with Rosendo, then the lender can issue a notice of sale exactly th um, three months later. So we're looking at basically May 22nd with an auction date sometime in early June. So I would say if either someone's going to make a deal with Rosendo before then, or you've got a June sale date uh, sometime around the second week of June. Now, if someone locks this down as a short sale, it's very possible the lender might accept it, or they might not. If uh, if they don't, and if and again, you got to get Rosendo and the lender to agree. If not, then this will be an auction property. Now, this is a notice of default record. 
Notice there's no auction information at the bottom. There is a section for us to um, write notes. There is a section for us to upload photos. And up on the very top, there's a save button. Now, I show this in our Wednesday presentation to show you how to set up folders, but you'll notice that to the left of the save button is a drop-down arrow that I can select. And if I go down, I think I have a San Diego folder. Yes, I do. So I can select the San Diego folder, and I could say that I'm very interested in this property, and I can hit my save button. And I just saved Rosendo's house to my San Diego My Properties folder for later use because maybe sometime down the road, I'm going to want to use that for one of my Wednesday presentations to show you some of the other ways that I set it up so that I can be notified if he gets that notice of sale coming up in May, setting up an auction in June. Now, if you want to know how I set that up, look at my last Wednesday presentation where I did exactly that. I picked up a notice of default property and I set up a, a um, polygon search looking for upcoming sales in the same area and that way I made sure that I would get an email notifying me if a notice of sale came out on that particular property. So do yourself a favor, go to our YouTube channel and, uh, and look at our last Wednesday presentation and you'll get a chance to see exactly how I did that. That being said, Let's go ahead and do some searching and look at properties that are going to auction. Now, I just click, closed the, uh, that property profile by clicking on the X up on top using the Google Chrome tabs for open windows. Now, every record page um, has the possibility to close it by clicking on this X up on top or going to one of the designated um, closing buttons that we have. Now, if it's on this search screen with the notice of default, I'm going to click where it says return to property search here on the right in dark letters. I'm going to click on that. Notice that closed it out. So I can close it out two ways, by clicking on the tab X up on tops, or uh, if there's a specific uh, uh, area on that particular page to close it out. Now. We just saw how to do a notice of default search for that San Diego County area. Let's look at what happens when I choose upcoming sales or auction properties instead. So now I'm going to select upcoming trustee sales. Look at what just happened. The listed dates that I had there for a full month going back to February are gone. Now I have auction dates instead. The reason being is that our system automatically will pick a category of dates that matches the category under the choose one option. So once I pick upcoming sales, the, the system recognizes that I want to have the most opportunity and it's assumed that I'm looking to buy properties at an upcoming auction. So what the system did is it omitted those listed dates and it plugged in auction dates instead. Notice also the difference. Instead of looking backward, we're looking forward. So notice my auction dates don't go to 331. They start with today's date, 331. Okay, so it gives me a two-week range. I can expand this to a full month, up to 32 days actually, or I can cut it back to a single date if I want to target one specific date. Now remember what I said at the beginning. I want to target um, April 7th, which is next Friday. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change both of these dates. I'm going to use the forward arrow in front of today and go to April and pick Friday the 7th. Now, the next date is the 14th. I could leave it that way, and I would search Friday through the following Friday. But I don't want to do that. I want to narrow my search. I want to give myself a, a smaller target area, because we want to look at some properties real quick. And I'm going to make, back that up to April 7th. So now, what I've just done is I've localized my search from April 7th to April 7th, just one day. Now. I want to further narrow my search by targeting a very specific location where the auctions are going to be held. So notice I've got a sale location window down here, and I'm going to pick Main Street in El Cajon, because I know that's where Kurt's going to be presenting next Friday. So now what I've just done is I've localized my search to upcoming sales. I've specified only Friday, and I've specified just one location, because that's where my my uh, my bidder is going to be 
with cashier's checks in hand ready to buy my properties if I plan to buy them at the auction. Now, the standard view format is always my preferred format. If you're somebody that's a, a numbers cruncher and you like to create spreadsheets, you might want to choose Excel or CSV or DBF. I like the standard format. It's got a lot of really great features, including the mapping functions. And for the ease of use on the website, I find the standard feature just works really well for me. So I'm going to go ahead. Now, also I want to point out, I can get more specific in this search. If I want to select designate property use, notice I've got a window here that says any type. It's got a drop down arrow and I could pick only single family homes, only condos, only apartment buildings, duplexes, fourplexes and larger, industrial, commercial. When I pick any of these designations, the system gives me subheaders. I can get really down and dirty and only look for hotels. I can start looking only for um, factories. Um, I can get really close on agricultural. Now, I tend to think less is more when I'm putting a search together because quite frankly, I've already narrowed my search down pretty tightly, haven't I? I've specified only upcoming auctions, only that date, and only that uh, location. Now, one more thing I'm going to do is I'm going to specify only active sales by checking this box here because by checking this box, I'm going to eliminate any sales for Friday that have been already canceled because if it's already canceled, I'm not going to buy it at the auction. Now, if it does get canceled, there are opportunities still. And on some of my other Friday presentations, I talk about that. Uh, but what we're going to do at this point is we're going to look at just what's going to go to auction on Friday. Oh, uh, Carla had a question. What if we bid at, uh, bid at the auction and our cashier's check is for more? That's fine, Carla. The entire system is designed for that. If you hand them a check for 500000 and your purchase price is two fifty then within two weeks you're going to get a, a, a business check in the mail for the change. So every trustee that processes foreclosure paperwork knows this process backwards and forwards. They're going to get that cashier's check from you and the receipt that you fill out at the auction says Carla paid two fifty, not five hundred thousand. So immediately what they're going to do is as soon as that cashier's check clears they're going to cut you a check for the balance and you're going to get that in the same envelope with your trustees deed upon sale that you take to record to the county. So don't worry about it. People overpay all the time. Uh, it's, you got to make sure you have enough to cover what you're willing to bid and most of the time when a bidder goes to auction with a maximum price in mind, they end up paying less than that at the auction and it's assumed that I'm going to get my change. Now, what I like to do and what I recommend my, recommend my clients to do is have a group of checks, break them up, have maybe a big one and some little ones or several big ones and then a couple little ones because if you overpay by five grand, uh, you're waiting two weeks to get five grand back. If you overpay by 500 grand, then that's going to be a long two weeks, isn't it? So you want to make sure that you're going to wait uh, that two weeks for as little as possible just to let you rest a little bit easily and, and, and sleep a little bit better. Okay. That being said, let's do a search and see what's going to go to sale next Friday that's only active sales. Okay. And I'm going to hit search and here's my report. So now this is my report in the um, notice of trustee sale format. Notice what's immediately different. The icons on the map are different colors. Whereas the notice as a default were orange, these are now green and yellow. Now, notice there are other options here. If some of these sales had already finished, then I would have some properties that were purple if someone bought them as, an, as a third party buyer like you or me, or blue if they were an REO because someone else had bought them who was in fact the bank. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, it's important to point out, every auction that is held ends with a winner. Now, if that winner is you or me, then it'll be a third party buyer, an investor or a person buying the house to live in. If the bank, who held the auction because they weren't being paid winds up winning the auction because nobody steps up and outbids them, then the bank wins the auction. Uh, 
So REO properties, banks that are lender owned, are lender owned because at the auction, nobody outbid the bank. Okay, now, can we buy those from the bank? You bet, a lot of people like to chase REOs after the auction. However, a lot of your great deals are held at the auction, and if I go to buy a property from the lender after the auction, the lender does have a right to set a price based on market. So just remember, at the auction, the lender is limited to what they are owed in terms of what they can ask for. But once the auction's over, if the lender owns the property, the sky's literally the limit, and the lender has a lot more say in the matter. As a matter of fact, it's just like a short sale offer. If I go to make an offer before the auction, and the homeowner owes more than the value of the home, then I've got to ask not only the homeowner to agree, but the lender to agree. If it's after the auction and the bank is now the owner, now the bank is going to hire a broker or a realtor to represent their interests and the interests of their shareholders, and it's their obligation to try and get as much as they can. That's why if you can get the property before the auction, if there is an equity position already, or if you can get it at the auction because there's an equity position, do so. Take advantage of the opportunity while the iron's hot. Now, uh, like with that previous report, my map reflects 0 to 20. Now, we don't have 336 records because remember what I did. I wasn't searching a whole month. I was searching a single day. So we only have 33 properties. So below, because it's 33 is less than 40, I'm going to click the 40 down here on the left. And I've just reformatted my map. And these are all the records that are set to go to auction next Friday. Now, we're going to start working our way down the report because we've got about um, we got about a half hour to work through this list, a little less than that. So we're going to see what we got, and I'm already seeing some very interesting things. So let's look at the very first property. This one's in San Diego. This one's on Cassiopeia Lane. Um, so the, this is a muse, if you're familiar with any of your old uh, mythology from high school. Uh, this is Cassiopeia was a muse. Uh, and so this is, um, if I open this up, I think I'm going to find some properties, uh, some a bunch of streets with different uh, Greek type names. So let's click on that and open the profile. So this property on Cassiopeia. Here's Cassiopeia Lane. Now, notice that it's putting a little cursor here off to the side, but it does say Cassiopeia. Now, what do we have here? Teresa Miller is the trustor. Teresa Miller is also the owner. So this is similar to the one that we just looked at as a notice of default. Notice also the Cassiopeia Lane address is her mailing address. It's also the property address. So it appears that what we have is Teresa is a property owner. She bought her property, purchase date 2003, loans from 2006 and 2014. So what we have is a situation where she bought her house in 03, she refinanced in 06 because the market value went up, so she took out some cash and paid off her original purchase loan. And then in 2014, for somehow she was able to borrow another 100,000. So now it appears that she owes about um, somewhere in the range of about 400000 Now, uh, I'm going to tell you something that to, to keep in mind. Notice that our system is tagging the loan that's for 318 from 06, and we're showing an amount owed. Now, notice what's different in a notice of sale record versus the notice of default. There's no delinquent amount here, and there's no um, as-of date. Instead, we have the amount owed figure down here below, that matches up to the loan that's foreclosing. Now, also notice, the loan from 06 was 318. It's gone down. So she doesn't owe 418,000 like it says here. The 318 has dropped to 199. So this is a $200,000 loan from 2006. It's not 318. So now, the loan here from 2014, is either a standard loan where she borrowed 100000 or this could be an equity line. I'm kind of leaning that this might be an equity line, but I'm not sure. I'm guessing. But let's say that she does owe the 100000 on the second and the 200000 on the first. That would mean that she owes right around $300,000. What's her estimate of value here? About two ninety. Looks to me like she owes right about market value, doesn't it? 
okay so she owes right about market value on this property if we add both loans together if we go to make an offer then if I'm going to offer less than what's owed, that's what? A short sale. If I'm going to offer what is owed, then I'm paying market price or even more. Okay? Now, so let's say that she owes right about market value on this property. Well, as an investor, I'm not going to pay that. Okay? As an investor, I want to pay less. So how can I make sure I pay less on this property? Can I get there today? Sure, I can make a short sale offer. If I can get these lenders to take a haircut, but this brand new loan, this one that's only uh, two and a half years old from 2014, um, do, do I really think I can get them to take a haircut? I don't know. Now, again, if this is not $100,000 that she borrowed all at once, if this is an equity line, she might only owe twenty grand on this loan. Now, the only way to know is to go to Teresa and make her an offer and see if she'll take it. Now, if my offer is... Uh, let's say my offer is two hundred thousand. Just just for argument's sake, let's say my offer is two hundred thousand. I feel that if my if I pay for my rehab, uh, twenty grand. If I pay a realtor, ten grand. Uh, then I could potentially walk away with about seventy if I sold. Uh, or or uh, let's uh, and let's say that I no. I, let's say I sell it for two seventy five. Uh, that means that I could walk away with about forty um, grand in profit. Okay, real basic, real simple. Now, if I can get her to agree to that, that's fine. However, if she says no, or either of these two lenders say no, then I can't close my short sale. So, I think the deal here is to bid at the auction, assuming the lender who's owed 199 is going to open the auction at 199 Now, would I pay 199 for this? Good question. I just threw a number in the air. Yes, Carla, a short sale. You, notice she lives at the address. Let's go ahead and zoom in on this property using using the wheel on my mouse and hitting bird's eye. Okay. So these look like townhomes. Okay. Notice it looks like we've got um, – these look like garages over here. And it looks like these are their houses over here. So it looks like you kind of got, this is the setup. Notice you got, let me zoom out a little. Oh, I guess I'm as zoomed out as I can get. So notice what it looks like. It looks like these are carports. And it looks like these are where they live. And so they like park and walk around, I guess. Okay. So let's just say, for instance, that this is a townhome. Okay. Notice the layout. Notice what it looks like. Okay. See, that's what I'm saying. It, it looks like, so either this is a storage center. Yeah, this might be a storage center. I might have that wrong. So this might be a storage center, and they might just have, like, uh, carports in here. It's just kind of hard to tell. Once you go in and take a look at it and see what their setup is, because these could be garages. Now, there, yeah, these look like garages there. Okay, so that's their layout. Okay, so her garage is probably back here. Okay, so let's say I go to talk to Teresa, I go to her house, I go to make her an offer, and I say, I'd love to buy your place, I'd love to give you 200000 She's either going to say yay, yay or nay, yes or no, okay? If she accepts my offer at the house, then I'm going to go to a local escrow and try and get my escrow open because she's got a property going to auction on Friday. Let's say I go to talk to her and the house is empty because she's already packed up her belongings and hit the road. That's possible. Or you could go to talk to her and she says, oh, no, everything's fine. I've got it all worked out. I can't tell you how many people have heard that one. Okay, doesn't mean she's got it all worked out. It just means she doesn't want to have a conversation today. Okay, now the homeowner has a right to say yes, no, or I'm busy. Okay, what we have to do is set a price point and determine how we're going to get there. So if I determine I'm willing to pay 200000 and go to the auction, then I'm going to go there. Now, can the lender ask for less than 199 at the auction? You bet. You bet. What if the lender's done the math and they've realized that they need to sell this for 175 because they know an investor's going to want to make a certain amount of money? Okay? Then they could set the price. Now I kind of tend to lean towards. I think they're going to open it what they're owed. I think they're going to ask for the two hundred thousand. This is almost brand new. This is only a thirteen-year-old building, so I think they're going to ask for the two hundred thousand. And I think it's possible they'll get it. If I could get this unit for two hundred thousand, two bedroom, two bath, I could turn this into a rental. This is a nice little area. 
Okay, now again, when we're classifying our properties, we hit the uh, road view, we zoom out. Now, this is centrally located off of the uh, the um, the 905 and the 805. Let me zoom out a little bit more. So you might have, this might be a decent spot to have a rental unit. So if you decide that that's the case, set your maximum price. See if Teresa will sell it for, to you for the same amount. If she tells you to go away and you know, not, she won't do the deal, then don't worry about it. Set this up as a bid, knowing the auction will start at 200000 And if you set your cap at 205, so be it. If somebody else is willing to spend 225, that's for them. Okay. If you're willing to spend 225, then it's then it could be for you. If you're buying a house for somebody that that you care about and you want to just give them a place to live and you can get it for sixty thousand dollars below market, then that might be worth your while too. So remember, your goal determines your price, and your price determines how you can buy it. Okay. So this one, I would set my price. And I'd be ready to go. The one thing I would check on, though, before the auction, the purchase date is 03, the loan is 06. Make sure there's no senior loan. I, I can tell you right now, 99.9% .9 chance this 318 is the first because our researcher says it, and it doesn't make sense that, that there would be a senior loan. If you're going to bid at the auction, though, you're throwing the dice if you don't make a call to title. So always make that call to title double check our work and then you'll make sure that you that, that you know because if we don't know we don't bid okay I'm going to close that one out now what was really interesting to me is the second one on the report this is on El Paso Street in La Mesa now what is why is this one interesting to me first of all this is a four hundred and fifteen thousand dollar estimated value property and the market value is about 282 that's a lot of equity that I see staring at me in the face. And to show you what I mean, look over here under auction equity, 132,000. Now, this looks like a detached home. It's got an 11,000 square foot lot size, and it, or 11, excuse me, 1,100 square foot lot size. That would be big, huh? 1,100 square foot lot size, but it's a 7,700 square foot lot. And what is appealing to me is that I notice that we have a second here in our senior junior loan column. Notice how on that first she had a second of $100,000 on, on Cassiopeia. But this particular property, their second is a dollar. This is a reverse mortgage property. I see these every day now, and I like to point them out to folks so you know what you're talking about when you see one of these properties. This means that you've got a homeowner that decided to pay off their previous loan if it was there or they simply had already paid off their home and decided to take out a reverse mortgage where the lender pays you over the life of the loan. Now, this is what retirees have a tendency to do if they've got their house paid off and they simply want to create an income stream like an annuity. So let's go ahead and open up El Paso and let me show you why I find this one interesting. So first of all, um, what we have is we've got a loan from 2007, and again, reverse mortgage, the telltale sign is the second of a dollar, okay? Whenever you see that, that means that the borrower had either paid their house off already, or they used this purchase loan to pay off their, or, I'm sorry, they're using this refinance loan to pay off their original purchase. Now, whatever loan might have remained would have been paid off out of the total sum that was paid out over the life of this loan. Now, that amount is going to be shown here as the amount owed to lender. This is what was paid out of the 544. Disregard the 544. This 282 is all that's owed. Now, this is important. Mary uh, Giannis, Mary Giannis is the trust or she's the one who took out this reverse mortgage now she's also the owner on title so the question comes down to this did Mary pass on or is the reason that this property has gone into foreclosure is that Mary failed to keep up other things current she may have failed to keep her insurance or her taxes current uh, 
which means there could be an opportunity to go to the property and offer to purchase a property from Mary because Mary has to pay 282 923 to satisfy the lender. So the amount owed of 282 is much less than the market value of the home of about 415. Hence our system is giving us an auction equity figure of 132,000. There's enough room here for me to make an offer to her if she's still a, a, available to talk to. Now, if I go to the property to talk to Mary and Mary is not available to talk to, um, the house could be vacant. Okay, or there might be a son or daughter living in the property because in most cases uh, you're going to find that Mary is probably um, a senior citizen and that she chose to do the reverse mortgage to keep her comfortable in her senior years. And then for some reason, again, the terms of the, of the agreement were not kept either because Mary passed away prematurely or because she didn't uh, keep her taxes or her insurance current. You're going to find out if you go to make an offer. Okay, now let's say I go to the property and let's zoom in again and look at the property. Okay, corner house. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, so we've got a corner house here and uh, not a bad area. Let's see if we can zoom out a little bit. Okay, notice we've got some green, green area back here. Okay, so. Um, Let's just say that we're interested in this neighborhood. Okay, now first of all, we can say, all right, what am I willing to pay for this property? Assuming it's worth about $415. Uh, I'm going to check Zillow really quick. I want to check Zillow because sometimes what happens is, let's say that if Mary had passed away and she had family, and she had taken the appropriate steps so that the family could um, sell the property if anything happened to her, because you've got a $400 plus thousand dollar home where she only owes three. There's room here for the family to make some money if there's family to make money. Okay, so now we don't know the answer to that question. Is there, are there sons and daughters? Is there someone in the house? Is there a, is there a spouse that was not included in the paperwork? So therefore, there's a, a you know live-in boyfriend that was in the house. We don't know. Now, if we go to the property and go to talk to someone, the main question is this. Do you have the power to sign for Mary? Can you accept my offer to buy the property? Because if not, if this person that's left in the property after Mary has left is not able to sign any paperwork or create a uh, or, or get a probate going, this will go to auction. Okay. Remember, the whole process of foreclosure is designed to take a house that can't sell and make it sellable again. Okay, so now, if Mary's not available, if it's completely vacant, if the person that's there is completely out of touch and doesn't know what to do, then this house will go to auction. It will go to auction for what's owed of about 282. Okay, now, at the auction next Friday in El Cajon, they're going to open at about 280, and it seems like it's worth about 415. Okay, so if that's prime for me, then I'll have my cashier's checks ready. I'll be at that location for when they call the sale at the 1030 auctioneer. And uh, I might not be the only bidder because other people will spot this for what it is. This could go for 305000 310000 We don't know. Okay, what we do know is we need to set a price and be ready to bid. But go make an offer because whoever's in the property, they just need to cover that 282. So you could possibly buy it for the same price you could at auction by making an offer to the homeowner. You're not going to be able to buy the note uh, because this is a reverse mortgage and they need to close out the file. So what I'm going to say is this, target this as an opportunity to bid at auction, but be ready to make an offer to the family this week if possible, if not first thing Monday morning. Okay. Otherwise, get your cashier's checks ready because this could go to auction and this could be a deal. Now, my next one on the list, this is a condo. Notice whenever it has a unit or apartment number, that's designated as a condo. This is a one-bedroom, one-and-a-half-bath condo in San Diego on Friars Road. Uh, notice the lot size is zero because this is a, um, a very, again, this is a small condo, 959 square feet. Okay. Notice also, we have what looks like a first is for closing for 344. 
the property's value is about 338. So this is kind of a wash. They, they, they pretty much owe what the property's worth. Now, strangely, it looks like there's a second for 435. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because uh, that would mean they owe somewhere close to $800,000. Um, what I think is more likely is maybe they got some kind of a modification a few years back and then they actually made a good hard try to pay it down. Um, so I'm guessing that there's that there's only one loan here. I could be wrong. Okay, that's okay. So look at what we got here. Somehow in the system, the we picked this record up two times. Okay. Notice the 435, 478, 435, 478, and notice the amount owed to lender is the 344. I'm making a wild guess here. I think this is a reverse mortgage too. Let's scroll down a little bit. Citibank is the lender. Yeah, you know what? I think if you research this a little deeper, because these are two identical figures and identical dates, the fact that they're identical dates leads me to think this should be a one dollar like that last one. Okay, so I'm going to say, just for argument's sake, that they owe only the 344. This second here is a ghost, so the 344 is what they owe. They owe about market value. You could go and try and make an offer on the property and see if you can get it accepted as a short sale because if it's only worth about 338 in terms of a resale value, you certainly don't want to pay 344 to the current owner. Okay, what you want to do is you want to pay closer to two. Okay, so bottom line is this, you're going to make a short sale offer or you're going to wait for this to go to auction. At the auction, guess what's going to happen? I think you're going to get what's called a dropped or a specified bid. Now I scroll down to the auction details section, there isn't an opening bid yet, that's not a surprise. Nine times out of ten, you're not going to see an opening bid until the auction begins. So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see an opening bid. I think your lender is going to shave this. I think they're going to open the auction for about $210,000. Okay? And because I'm so sure of that, I'm going to scroll down to my status update option here below the auction details and I'm going to click the status change box and I'm going to put in my email address. I'm going to bet myself lunch. I love I love to bet myself lunch because that way if I, uh, I if I lose or I win I win so I'm gonna put in Bob at County Records Research and when I get an email okay um, gosh. That was really slowed on the uptake there. I had to type that in. There we go. There is my email address. So I've typed in Bob at countyrecordsresearch.com. I've selected status changes and I'm going to hit submit. There we go. So now it's just taken my information and I'm going to get an email through my, my properties folder that's going to notify me of a status update. Cause what I think is going to happen, I think in between now and next Friday, this lender is going to discount that opening bid to somewhere between um, 210 and 225 because I would think in this circumstance they're going to want to simply put this property up for sale and get what they can. If they open the auction at about 210 or 220, then they could get as much as 250 for this place. And I don't think they're going to get much more than that. But I think they have to start it at a lower price to invite people to bid at the on the property, and because uh, if they start at 250, that's kind of iffy, okay. But if they start at 220, I think they'll get a, they'll get at least one taker. And if they announce the the bidding uh, to start at that price the morning of the auction or the day before, then they'll probably get several people to come in and buy this property because it seems to be in a good location right next to a golf club, a really good place for a retiree to live. And notice that the trustor is the Gene A. Brown family trust so I have a very strong feeling that I'm right about this and that that's uh, that that was a reverse mortgage uh, you could go by the property and find out um, but uh, I think you're gonna find this probably will the property will probably wind up going to sale now finally we have the lat the, the next one on Meadowbrook Drive in San Diego and I'm running out of time but we're just gonna kind of give some overviews this is a, um, a three bedroom one and a half bath um, looks like we've got a large lot size, 11, 
uh, 11,000 square feet, 1,380 square foot house. This one uh, is right of below market value. The bank is owed 351. Property's worth 369. If this goes to sale on Friday, I think the lender will discount. I think if they open at 351, that's not low enough. Um, I think that they're going to need to take this down below three if they want to uh, to score a bidder at the auction. If they're willing to take it back as an REO, they'll open it at the 351. This one on Hartford in San Diego, two bedroom, one and a half bath, small lot, uh, 1,141 square feet, probably a newer property. This one, uh, the bank is owed more than market value by about $20,000, plus there's a $100,000 or $99,000 second. Uh, I think this lender is going to take a haircut. I think you're going to see an opening bid uh, below $500,000. If you do, this will be bought by a bidder. If they try to get anywhere near what they're owed, this is going to also wind up being an REO. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to have to cut it off here. Thank you so much for joining us for our Friday presentation. This will get loaded up to our um, our YouTube channel so that you can add, we can add to our library of presentations. So please feel free to join us by going to our YouTube channel and watch our previous Wednesdays and previous Fridays. Also, feel free to go to our calendar of events on the lower left-hand side of our main page anytime by clicking on Calendar of Upcoming Events so that you can uh, join us any Wednesday and every Friday for our live presentations. Remember, we're always going to look at different properties every day. We're always going to find different types of deals, but every time we open up the website and look for opportunities, we're going to find them. This has been Bob with County Records Research. Thank you again for joining us for our March 31st Friday presentation. We'll see you next week.